VIP access. VIP access with Aniko on Africa Loud. Welcome to the very first episode of my podcast, VIP Access. The second season is here. It's really, really exciting for me to be in this position, to be speaking to an artist who I love so much. I've been able to work with him from the very start of my career. He's taught me a lot of life lessons, a lot of business lessons. And today I'm here <laughs> with the one and only high-flying Kenyan, American, entertainer, performer, rapper, mm. singer, songwriter, all round, good vibes, King yes. Kanja. What's up, dude? Yes. Yes. <laughs> What's up? How are um, you? I'm officially, you know, home in Kenya. Sorry, coming off a wild night. My first coming home party last night at Gemini. So, you know, I'm happy to be here. You know, when it's it's work time, it's work time. So, but this it's never work when it's fun. When you love what you do, you know, it's it's, it's a joy it's, every it's day. It's almost always like it's 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 work and fun for you. Yeah, you're yeah. always having fun and you're always working. Yeah, yeah, and that's the beautiful thing about life. You know, when you do what you love, it's never a job. You know, so awesome. Yeah. So, who is King Kanja? You know, where do you live in America? I think. Because me and my team handle your PR, mm -hmm. there's an impression that you're in Kenya mm -hmm. or you're somewhere in Africa because you're also touring around Africa. But most of the year, you're actually based in America, yeah. you know, touring, you know, hanging out with your artist friends, collaborating. Mm -hmm. So what's your year like? Where do you actually reside? Man, I... To answer that question, I would say I reside in the world. You know, I can't say I reside. I just have a home. But I, <laughs> my home, for real, is is the world. And um, but I'm based in um, um, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is like outside of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've lived in L.A. a couple times. So, you know, I'm kind of like everywhere. But I, I'm a globe trotter. Like my comfort zone is outside my comfort zone. So I love that. You know, I love that. Yeah. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Maryland. Mm -hmm. I was born in London, um, but I would come to Kenya every summer since a since a child, and that influenced my my thinking and my understanding of life and family and mm. culture, and you know tribal customs and just things that help influence the person I am in the U.S. You mm. know today, but um, you know there's no place like home. Like I've gone a lot of places in the world, but there's nowhere like Kenya. Kenya is just home. Okay. Yeah. Were you born of parents who are ambassadors of sorts? Because you've you've been in different countries, lived, you know, born in London, now in America. Yeah. How how did that end up yeah, being um, the case? Yeah, my, my funny story, my, my parents actually met in London. Mm -hmm. You know, they're both, you know, Kikuyu, you know, both Kenyan, and they met in London and um that led my father was always doing accounting, my mom was doing nursing at the time. And my father got a job with the World Bank. And, you know, now that I think about it, it was kind of interesting to see, like, you know, for, like my parents influenced my career when they left their homeland. Like, to leave home, I think, is a very difficult decision. And that decision they made helped put me in a place where I could really just think outside the box because I wasn't, like, home. So I had to just know I wasn't home. But I made somewhere that wasn't home, home, home. you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just interesting. And um, that just influenced my life a lot, you know, just being able to see that, you know. And being born, you know, in a metropolitan city like, you know, London, and then moving on to, a, into, moving on to America. But I feel like even before African music became such a global thing, mm -hmm. you've always been representing Kenya, representing yeah. Africa 100%, you know, from um, singing in Swahili, rapping in Swahili, how you dress, like, look at the hat you have on, like, mm -hmm. how did you manage to always have, you know, this very strong African brand, even though you were not being born and raised in Africa like that? I think my parents always reminded me where I was from. Like, you know, they always let me know that, you know, like growing up, it's like you do what all the other kids do. And my parents always reminded me where I was from and that, I, you know, I may not need to be like everyone else, mm. you know, but just to be myself. And remember, we have certain things that we uphold, you know, as people. And, um, yeah. Did you speak Ikuyu? 
Yeah, I actually speak to my show, show, you know, <laughs> Kikuyu, you know, like, you know, it was funny, like, growing up, like, that's the language I spoke most. Swahili was kind of like, it came later on, but Kikuyu was like my first, other than English language that I spoke, and um, yeah. Nice. So we go way, way back, uh, literally before you release your first studio project. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, I, I mean, when did we actually meet or start working together? I, I think it's around 2015 or 2016, mm -hmm. because your debut project came out in 2017, Vibes. Yeah, the Vibes EP. And I think we're already promoting that. Yeah. But what were you doing before 2017? Like, when would you say you got into the music industry um, professionally and knew, I want to put out a record, I want to start working onto it? You know, who are the people who supported that endeavor for you? Yeah, like, when I went, I went to Hampton University um, in Hampton, Virginia, and I used to go to Virginia Beach every day. And... Um, I used to just like drive by Missy. I knew where Missy Elliott and Teddy Riley lived. So I used to just drive by their house and just dream like, you know, like I want to be there one day. One time I saw Missy Elliott's mom outside gardening with diamonds <laughs> You're on. You're like, hi, you know? hi, Missy's mama. Right. <laughs> and um, I just knew like, I think I was around 16 when I was like, I I got injured. I used to play basketball and I stumbled in the studio and I just, you know, one of my friends asked me to do an ad lib and I was like, what's that? And the moment I like recorded on the mic, I knew that was what I was gonna do for the rest mm. of my life. And then, um, you know, I just started doing it gradually, like recording music and just perfecting the craft. One thing about me is when I really wanna be great at something, I'm gonna not stop and I'll never look back. And then when I was in college, um, I used to go to Virginia Beach every day to go to the studio. And I stumbled upon some guys who were, um, you know, bringing the executive producer at the time, Pat Charles, um, to audition for BET 10 System Park. Mm. You know, so they had told me like, yo, you know, we already partnered with him. You're good. You're going to get a slot. So he, they were just having auditions for other artists. Mm. And then I was just like um, there and I was just like, there's no way I'm going to be here. I was just watching. I wasn't even supposed to perform. And I was like, there's no way I can be here and I'm not going to perform in front of the executive producer. So these guys were trying to do Freestyle Friday. And everybody was scared to do Freestyle Friday. Everyone just wanted to perform for Wild Out Wednesday, which is where you perform your original song. And I just stood up and I was like, yo, I'll battle anybody. I just, <laughs> you know, I ended up battling a couple guys. Then Pat Charles was like, let me hear your original song. And the song that I, I had just done at that time was called Shorty Say Hey, mm. my first single. And um, I performed it for him, blew it out the park. And then next thing, you know, he took us out to... Um, took us out to dinner and it was just an amazing. Then I got on BT's 101 System Park and won, you know, by like 75% of the votes in 2009. And to me, that was my debut into the music industry because, you know, it was like 4 million viewers. It, it crossed into Europe and, and of course, Africa and Kenya. Mm. And that kind of catapulted me into the music scene, which led me to my first meeting with Akon. And at the time, Sylvia Ron was president of Universal Motown. She's now the head of Epic, you know. She signed Fabulous, Missy, Future, Khaled. You know, she's probably the most powerful black woman in the music industry. You know, and that's kind of like where I got my, you know, my feet wet. And then I've been doing it ever since. I've never looked back. And oh here we God. are. I love that about you because you see an opportunity, you take it. You're like, I'm not even going to wait to be asked. I'm not even going to wait... Um, for somebody to ask me for a collaboration, I like this person, mm. let's do this. Yeah. I like that about you. Where'd you get that drive? Because I feel like that's very necessary, especially for, um, I mean, to just be in the industry because a lot of people are doing stuff, putting stuff out. So if you're not on it, if you're not aggressive, if you don't go for the opportunity, somebody else is going to go for it and you're not going to be relevant. Yeah. So... Where'd you get that drive? I think I think it's just my spirit, like, and my spirit comes from here. You know, what <laughs> it's I mean? a Kenyan spirit. It's a Kenyan spirit because like Kenyans work hard, you know, and I feel like I knew you got that African like hustle mentality. Yeah, and I took that over there, and I and I made it even more hustle, you know. And I and then I I watched how people hustle in New York, and then I watched how people hustle in D.C. and then. 
I hung out with a couple guys where I just saw how they were hustling, and it's just the hustle mentality just took over. And it's just like, you know, why not work hard to be able to live how you want, do what you want? You know what I mean? It's just yeah. it's just different because it's like when you're not active, when you become lazy in what you do, you just don't get, yeah, you never want to be complacent, and then you don't get the results you want. And that's just never been me, you know? And I learned that also, I, I used to play basketball, so I learned team camaraderie and just how to be, you know, a team player, like mm. being a, a basketball player, that taught me that, and being competitive, you know, how it felt like to win, how it felt like to lose, you know, that feeling, and just like the feeling of winning just was addictive. You know, and it's like, why why wouldn't you work as hard as you can to win? You know, and I've just gone through a lot of different obstacles in the music industry. A lot of people wanted to just sign my life away and just, it's crazy what goes on in the industry, but I just kept my own stability, ownership, you know, creativity, and just, you know, taking it to where it is now, you know. So you talk about a lot of people wanting to write you off, you know, not supporting you, but you never, you know, lost the, the you never lost your vision and now you're mm -hmm. here. Um, when would you, when would you say was the, the moment that you felt like I'm on the right path and I think I made it. I think I did what I wanted to do and I'm on the right path. When were you happy, you know, with the work you've done? Mm. You know what it was like? I was... I was repping Africa and being African when when it wasn't cool to be African. That's what I said before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the U.S. Be before the African music blew yeah. up, even the U.S. And oh. even way before that, like, I was the first person. You can ask people at Universal um, Republic, you know, same label as Drake and Nicki and all that. I was the first person to take African Afro beats into that record label. And they told me they didn't know what to do with it at that time. Like, I was one of the people that did that. And... You know, I just, I don't know, something just told me like, oh, you know what it is? I used to be a rapper. I remember I was in the studio and um, my my big homie JB and um, and um, Trust, they was in the studio with me mm. and they were like, um, you just over here just rapping like us. And it's like, you're from Kenya. Like, why aren't you doing anything to represent where you're from? Like, mm. you have an advantage over all of us. And from that day, I knew it was in Virginia Beach where the art in the artist in me was born. Like I was gonna do it that way. And then it's like, then I won the competition on BET. But then it was always like when you do something great, there's always those people that be like, oh, but this, or oh, but that. Mm. You know what I mean? So it was interesting because it's like here in Africa and in Kenya, we have so many different um colors of people, so many different light skin, dark skin, brown skin, you know, and all black is beautiful, but in America, there's something called colorism where like people identify how somebody is by their, you know, their skin color. So like if you're light skin, it's automatically an assumption mm. that you're either half something or half that. Or so imagine this, like they don't in the US, a lot of people don't know that there's all shades of people here. They just so for me to be light skinned, they would assume like when I'd say I'm from Kenya, they thought I'll be lying. You see what I'm saying? So when I was on BET, I wasn't wearing the kufis then. So I was just wearing a hat. And I, I, at that time, I had like kind of like an identity crisis because I'm trying to be African. But to the audiences or people who just were the critics, they were like, but you don't look African. So I'm like, what? Since when do you have to look African to mm. be African? And then this girl that um, I was dating at the time, she was from Sierra Leone. I give her her credit. She was the one like, yo, you should start wearing the kufis. And she showed me a kufi website to this lady who made them. I started ordering from her, and I have worn the kufi ever since. And when I started wearing the kufis was when no one has ever after that asked me again, like, is he African? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's funny, right? Like, no one has ever asked me after How that. How many like, kufis do you own? Oh, I probably got like 100 now. Exactly. Yeah, 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 it's hard to carry them. I don't even have like a good container for them. I have to just set them up right Damn. in the hand luggage. But yeah. When they, when, when they be doing the MTV cribs, they're going to really show them what an African oh, yeah. celebrity yeah. house looks oh, yeah, like. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have a kufi closet for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that that was just um a landmark for me, you know, the kufis and then. You know, since then it's just been kind of just like a ride. And um I feel like I felt happy when I started wearing the kufis. But when I won that competition, like 
it led me to my highest triumph, but also my biggest mm -hmm. disappointment because I thought Akon and Universal were going to sign me and they kind of like brushed me off. Yeah, so you kind of had a high yeah. and then a yeah, low. Yeah, that's how it goes. And then I had this chip on my shoulder. I was like, okay, I'm going to show them. And then that's when I had moved back here. And then I was like, let me go build my Maybe fan Maybe that's when we met. I think that is when we met. Because then I did the Coca-Cola. Maybe we, we met Africa at Coke Let's... Studio. Is it? Yeah, because What's I did you... that Coca-Cola commercial, Africa Let's Go Crazy. Okay. And, um, but you came to Coke Studio. Yeah, you I went, did you, do you, the freestyle. You, you did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's how we met then. Because yeah, I was working it. at Coke Studio as a publicist of the show. Yeah. So I'm trying to trace when we actually met. That might be it. Because you had just come from America. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a beautiful time. Like, just like, because I'd only ever come over the summers. But you I, stayed for quite some time. Yeah, I did. That was actually, and I, and I think I had left. Right before that, um, that Westgate explosion. Yeah. Do you have family here? Yeah. You so know, you have like a, a lot home of to stay. I'm actually about to see my show show right after this. I haven't <laughs> seen her since I've been here. So I'm going to go to Gong, Gong Town. Nice. Go visit, you know. And Fantastic. then I have a family in Thika. I have family all over. I got family in London. You know, but only my immediate family is in the U.S. Just like yeah. uh, the extended cousins are out there. But, you know, yeah. Fantastic. So we've spoke about, um, you know, your distinct style, you know, getting onto BET, having expectations that was squashed and then getting it, finding your, standing, getting your feet back up, you know, when mm -hmm. things didn't work the way um, you wanted them to work. I want to talk about your versatility because I think you started out as a rapper. Now you sing, you're a music producer. You also went into this very prolific era in your career where you're collaborating with so many artists. When you see talent, you pick it up, you nurture it. You have very strong um, individuals who mentor mm. you. Unfortunately, one of them passed away. So I want mm. you to talk about the various inspirations and how you've managed to break down your artistry for us into different type of sounds, genres, yeah. you know, EP, albums, because you're not one thing. It's so hard for me to explain to somebody how King Kanja sounds because you're going to sound very different on different records. And, you know, you accept yourself the way you are and mm -hmm. you just enjoy. Yeah, I think there were, even when I started, there were people more talented than me, but I was more hungrier than them, you know. <laughs> and when you're hungrier than them, as, as far as what you're doing, like that will always put you above anybody because a lot of people are talented. There's a lot of talented people, but not a lot of people, you know, can do what I do, even do what you do. You know, it takes a certain type of talent to really take it to where it is, you know, like, and just having that mindset, like, I'm going to make it work. And just like, like you said, like, you know, accepting everything that goes right and goes wrong mm. and just taking those things and, and taking it to the next level. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how then do you decide that now I'm going to rap in this song, now I'm going to sing yeah. in this song, or I need different vibes completely in this um, album. We can talk about your discography. Mm -hmm. In 2020, you are quite prolific. You had two um, records out. You had Vibe Lord and Vibrations. Yeah. Was it Vibrations that was um, very reggae-ish? Yeah. That, and um, from my last I checked, I think... I, I'm the first Kenya artist to do a full grassroots reggae album. And that was produced by Gilly, who works with everybody from Dexter Dabs, you know, um, um, Freddie McGregor, you know, Anthony B, you know, reggae legends. And um, that album took me like two years to finish. I had to keep going back to Miami to go finish it. And it was like, you know, there's something about reggae. Like, I even noticed here, like, my own thought, I think Kenyans love reggae more than Kenyan music. Because whenever I go into a uh, reggae event here, it's crazy. It's you know, And, and that's where all yeah. these people come from. Yeah. yeah. And reggae just, I don't know, it just always hit my spirit a certain way. So it was always a, an, another chip on my shoulder. Like, I had to get into reggae at some point. But I started in hip-hop, tapped into R&B, and then, you know, I just kind of mixed in. And it was just like, I was always... I listened to so much music growing up, you know. And funny enough, kind of Bongo Man used to date my mom's cousin in the UK, you know. 
I don't I don't know what happened with that. I haven't checked. <laughs> but you know, like um, so like p- listening to that and Mogidi music mm. and just listening to like different sounds and just going in the in the village and in the town and just hearing the music that people are listening to, it just influenced me. So like I know what feels good. Yeah. So with all music, as long as it feels good, then it sounds good. First you go for it feels good. Yeah. And then then you start getting into it, like becoming more meticulous where you have the engineers and knowing the right engineers and the sound and, and for it to sound good. Yeah. You know, so for me, it was always just chasing that music high. Like, how can I make the best song? How can I sound the best? How can I do this? And then the Afro vibe started coming out, you know, from dance hall. And then I got into the Afro beats. And then that, that's just been a pocket that I've been in. And then now I'm kind of like in this Afro R&B pocket, you know? Yeah. And um, I actually met Bobby V here in Kenya when he had that show with Kerry Hilson. And oh, it was that's where like, you all yeah, met. That's where we met. We I met always here. thought you met in America. No, we met here. And we've been like best friends ever since. I know. I go to his mom's house. You know, like I know his family. I know his daughter. He know, but he knows about my son. Like we talk about everything as friends. But whenever we get in the studio, it's like we know we're gonna make a hit. Like we have mastered that part. He was already a master of his craft, and then I was becoming a master of mine. And Mm. it's like, you know, now we even got some crazy songs. Look out for a song called "Come Over." That's kind of like dance hall R and B. And then um, there's Mambo Nileo with yeah, we got Mambo Nileo with Petra. And then we actually got a show in Orlando February 17th. And then we go to Jamaica um, February 18th. Nice. We have another show with Rotimi. Because we did the show in Zambia with Rotimi, which yeah. was amazingly successful. You know, and then um, I have a show with my, you know, my day one friend who we got in this industry together. I am Dulo, big comedian. Like, we have two sold-out shows in London, you know, February 10th and 11th. So I'm just, like, in this pocket of just going and just, like, going. So, like, when I... You know, I was, I've been waiting to get back to Kenya because Kenya is like my cleanse and my refresh. And then I'm just able to go back out there and just take over and just go hard on the performances and everything. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So I, I do honestly feel like the last two albums, the Vibe Lord and the Vibrations, really are a culmination of all the hard work you put in, um, all the different expert sounds that you um marshal up to produce your albums and we can't wait for your next album which is supposed to drop this year to mm. you know when Kanja is actually dropping and why did you um you know title this album Kanja yeah um this next album Kanja like it's kind of like Kanja but the jaw like the god in me yeah you know and the reason I even came up with that name was like the um Gilly my producer in Miami, he's Jamaican. You know, he did. He produced my whole Vibrations reggae album. Mm. And every time he saved my name in the computer, he always spelt it with an H at the end. And I always wonder, like, why is he always saving it as Kanja? Mm. You know, but I was just like, <laughs> you know, like, Jamaicans either call me Ganja or they'll put Kanja with, like, an H at the end. So yeah. I was like, okay, that was a sign. Because that whole Vibrations album was very spiritual, like, because in that studio, like, you know, everyone would be smoking. Like, he would not allow smoking in the studio. But mm-hmm. outside the studio, like, there'd be a whole bunch of rosters smoking out of a chalice. It's a whole vibe. <laughs> then you go in the studio, it's like, and it's so hot out there. Like, you're sweating. But when you go in the studio, it's the air conditioning and the vibe just changes. And there's this big picture of Bob Marley. And it's like, every time I touch the mic, you know, it was like, you know, it was just an amazing experience. It was, it was a vibe. And it's like he always knew what to say. Like he could really produce me and pull it out of me. Mm. Like when I would be on the mic, he would just say, yo, yo, Kanja, relax, relax, relax. And when he would tell me that, I would get into this pocket vocally, you know, which is how that whole album came out. It and we just finished it over time. Such an amazing you know? album. Yeah. And shout out um, my boy, Young Dar Salama from um, TZ. He, he was on the album. He was in Miami. That's how he got on the album. We was in the studio. We swung by. We just did a record. And of course, um, Nyanda from Brick and Lay. She's on Different Vibration. Yeah. And you know, that was an amazing album. Now, Vibe Lord was just like, everywhere I went, I was, all, you know, I love the ladies. And every time I'd be around certain people and my vibe with the Kofi, girls always be like, yo, you a vibe. You a vibe. <laughs> You a vibe, you know what I mean? I can't hear you a You don't vibe. even have to talk, the Kofi B. Right, they were like, yo, whatever he is, he's like American, but he's African. He's like, he's a vibe. And then one time a girl said, yo, you a vibe, Lord. And when I heard that, I was like, 
that's the name of no, the album. No, but you are a vibe yeah. lord. You are. Yeah, because a, a vibe <laughs> lord is like a creator of a vibe. And yeah. I create vibes. So it's like, you know, you reach your pinnacle. And that's how like vibe lord came about, you know, so... That's how that album came out. And then Vibrations, then Kanja. And I already know the next album after Kanja is going to be called Sovereign. You know, that's my next album. Fantastic. You know, like, I've been watching um, a show on Netflix called The Crown. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about Queen Elizabeth. I have. And it's like, man, I, I'm I'm on the last season. I, I like, binge-watched it for, like, a week. There's a lot in there, and it's so crazy. Like, you know, she found out that um, her father passed, and she became queen while she was in Kenya. You know, Mad. so Kenya has a very powerful impact on the world, you know, and it was just like, um, you know, I understood what it means to be a leader. And like as sovereign, you always have a responsibility that, you know, it's like it's always about the crown. Like it's like everybody will cater to whatever has to be done to protect the crown mm. or to protect what you're there for. You know, so for me, I feel like it is a duty you know, to do what we do, you know, to do what you do, it's yeah. a duty and, you know, that's how, that's how that came about. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I, I want you to talk about somebody who inspired you so much, you know, to be who you are unapologetically. Unfortunately, they passed away, Chucky Thompson. Yeah. Um, who's Chucky? You know, how did you meet Chucky? What um, void is left in you after Chucky. Man, let me tell you, like passed away. All my mentors are just like have passed away. It's crazy. And I feel like now I'm a mentor. You know, it's like, but they gave me the battery in my back to go. And I was doing a show at the Howard, this is the Howard Theater in DC. And this um promoter manager, Steve Solomon, was there and he passed away, you know, before Chucky. And um he was just like, um, man, like you, I love your hunger. And he was like, I'm about to put you on a song with Wale, all that. Like he was managing Juvenile. Mm. He was part of um, that whole Cash Money family. And he was like, man, I'm going to take you to the studio. So he was already trying to sign me on a contract as everybody else does, you know. But, you know, me and him had, you know, you know, rest in peace. I never like to speak ill of the dead. But, you know, we had like a falling out at that time okay. because he tried to like, Sign me and then boom. But it's like, he took me to the studio. When me and Chucky met, sometimes you'll meet somebody through somebody that you may not deal with after that. Yeah. But me and Chucky just connected in a spiritual level. Like, we were friends from that day. And Chucky just taught me the game. We spent winters together. Like, he sat there and took me from music beginning to end. We watched a lot of gangster movies, The Godfather, you know, all those classic movies, Goodfellas. Like, he taught me... He introduced me to the streets of DC, everybody that ran the streets, all the gangsters, all everybody, like the the mayor, like Mario Bowser, the mayor right there. One day we had dinner with her, like she's currently mayor of DC. And he just put me on. And Chucky, like, he doesn't like the limelight. I'm mm. for the limelight. He likes to be behind the scenes. But like he was friends with everybody. Like we go hang out with, you know, Dougie Fresh or Faith Evans, who I'm now friends with. And it's crazy, I, you know. Crazy story, you know, to bring that back. Like his spirit is still with me. Like I was, he introduced me to Mary you, J. You Blige's speak brother. to him. You speak on him as if he's alive. You say Chucky doesn't like. You know, you don't even say that he didn't like. Yeah, it's I'm, quite it, interesting. The reason I know he's with me still, or his spirit is like crazy. I was in New York, and he introduced me to um, Mary J. Mary J. Blige's brother Bruce. So I linked up with him in New York, and then we go to this place called Brooklyn Chop House you know, which is owned by the guy who kind of helped Biggie get on. And when we're walking in, and I met, you know, Bruce through Chucky. When I'm walking in, Faith Evans is walking out. And Chucky, I met Faith Evans with Chucky a lot, and Faith comes out and she's like, yo, she's like, what are y'all two doing together? You know what I mean? And and we just started talking about Chucky. She's like, oh, so you're a conjure because she's like, Chucky was always sending her my music. Mm. And she saw my name, but she never knew who I was. So we just became close to exchange numbers. And he just like was my, he was my guide when he was alive. And now he's like my spiritual guide, you know, but he just taught me the game. He taught me how to be, he taught me things that I never learned. Like, you know, the way you deal with women and fame and money. And, you know, he taught me so much. And then he just was like, opened every door he could for me. You know what I mean? So... That was definitely um, a tough loss. Did Chucky produce any of your music? Yeah. Um, he produced a song I did called Weekend. Uh... Um, 
Um, he produced a song for me called Energy. And we actually have like a thousand songs that have not even been released. I got like a whole hip hop. Chucky produced. Yeah, I have like three hip hop albums that I haven't even released. Like I have so much music I want to release. I'm just trying to position. Like even music that I did then is timeless. Chucky's production is timeless. Like he produced the Mary J. Blige My Life album. You know what I mean? Crazy. He produced Biggie Big Papa. He produced Crazy. Nas One Mic. He produced that Shine and Barry Levington song, you know, Bonnie and Shine. Like, you know, he was a master of his craft. Like, he could play any song and change your whole emotion. Mm. He can make you smile. He can make you cry through music. I'm not even a crier, but he can make you emotional. Like, he made me emotional so many times just creating music. Like, he was the architect of R&B, you know? Like, every producer studied him, you know? Like, you know, so that was just an amazing to just watch him create. I wish I studied him as a producer more. I mm. regret that. Because, I, you know what I mean? I was just so focused on being an artist and a songwriter. Yeah. But I wish I had studied how he produced more. Because, man, I never seen nobody produce that. Like, I heard songs... He has, a, he has a song with Nicki and Kanye that's not been released that I kept hearing. Like, I was always I was always hearing music that was not out. You know, like all the new Mary J. Blige, you know. But he was just a peaceful, like, you know, peaceful character. Like, you know, like um, one night we was out with Stevie J and Jocelyn. That was crazy. Like, loving hip-hop in real form. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like... <laughs> I hope there was no drama that night. Oh, there was. <laughs> It was. You know? Always drama with Joe Sladies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big shout out to Stevie J. But Chucky taught Stevie J how to produce. You know, Stevie J produced, I think, Honey for Mary, yes. um, for Mariah Carey. Like, you know, it's just Chucky was like a big influence in the music industry, but he was like the silent one. Mm. You know, and you know, and, and you and he was one of the bad boy hitmen with Diddy. So he produced all of those, you know, bad boy songs. Nice. You know, so it was just amazing to just be around his presence, you know. So big shout out Chucky Thompson. His legacy lives forever, so you know. For sure, for sure. What's your relationship like with Mr. Brett Berish, the CEO of Sovereign Brands? Because, you know, I've seen you meet with him severally. I've seen um, Bel Air support yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. of your Big events. shout out Bel Air. I'm one of the Black Bottle Boys, you know. And um, it's what's, crazy. What's being a Black Bottle Boy? Like, what is it? What's that? Being a Black Bottle Boy is just like, you know, the whole concept is self-made. Like, you know, you made yourself. So if you notice the people oh, who are- Oh, self-made. Yeah, that's why the whole thing, theme is self-made. Mm. You see DJ Khaled and Rick, Rick Ross, Ross. All these people like, like Rick Ross used to sleep on couches. Like everyone's had those moments. Like I've, mm. I've slept on Drummer Boy's couch early on in my career. And Drummer Boy's a major producer. Like everyone that kind of had that story, like you were willing to do anything. Yeah. Put it all on the line. Last dollar, last thing, last gas tank to get where you need to go. Yeah. Like that mentality. You know, and um, it's kind of funny how I got to Brett. So um, shout out Greg um, Maxwell. He's the one. And my tour DJ, DJ Joe Cat, that he's from Tanzania, but he's the first African DJ to be on the radio. So Joe introduced me to um, to Greg. And Greg introduced- To be on which radio? Um, he's on 93.9 in DC, uh -huh. WKYS. Okay. So DJ Joe was like, yo, he's been my longtime tour DJ. He was like, let me take you to meet Greg. He's with Bel Air. So I go to Greg's house and he has all this Bel Air and he's like, yo, I want you to be one of the Black Bottle Boys. And he also introduced me to the Audio Mac um, founder. And um, I go to the Bel Air office and I got introduced to the you know, first few people, Sam, who was um, at the company at the time to be part of the brand. Mm. And then I just took that and I worked my way up the ladder to everybody in the company. And when I finally got to like, you know, the top people who run marketing, I literally just one day was like, because you, if you look at the company's um, email, you know, it's Sovereign Brands owns Bel Air, Boom Boom, McQueen, and um, Vion. They all have the same email. This is how I got to the CEO of Brett Berry. <laughs> like, I literally, I literally was like, if this is all their email, I bet you if I put his names together and write it to him, it's him. And it was him. That's how I got to him. <laughs> Right. Wow. Yeah, and then we just started talking ever since see, then. See, see, that's why I love this podcast. You know, this the concept of VIP access is because we see you sitting with Brett and we're like, no, it just happened, but it just didn't happen. No, you know, no, you yeah. made it happen. You worked your way to meeting with him, yeah. to securing this deal. Yeah, yeah, Fantastic. and they support me in everything, you know. 
Like every time I'm in any city, you know, I think everything will be officially back and running here in March. So we're going to be doing a lot of Bel Air parties in Nairobi, you know, but they, they're just supportive. Like you can shoot videos at their locations. Like they got this new Atlanta office. Amazing, you know. I'm, I'm definitely gonna tell them we should need to put an office out here because it's like the way they do the lighting and the setup with the bottles is out epic. of this world. It's very epic. So big shout outs to Bel Air, Sovereign Brands, Brett Barish, you know, everybody, Bree, who's the head of marketing for all the brands, Jess, who Jess is the one who set up um Jess, she's the head of marketing for Boom Boo. She's the one who set up um my first meeting with him. So shout out to her. You know, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So we're about to wrap up, but I wanted you to talk about um, branding and marketing. Mm -hmm. How important do you feel uh, branding and marketing is? And what would you like to tell the Kenyan artists watching you? You know, because you're one of our Kenyan ambassadors out there in America, mm -hmm. and I do appreciate how you don't joke around with your PR, like. You are hands-on, like each and every release, whether there's a video or not, you are paying for the PR, mm. you're supplying us with the pictures, new uh, press pics, new information, whatever we need from you, you're always very collaborative. And to me, as a music publicist, you're like the dream client and artist to work with. So I think it's very important for you to speak to other artists and let them know why you're on it like this and why it's important to be on it like this. Yeah. First of all, if you need a publicist, join, you know, Aniko PR, <laughs> you know, she's the best. Her and her team are amazing, you know. Asante, and, um, Asante. And for me, it's like, you know, funny enough, a lot of times I'm sending you guys pictures and, and, and messages. I'm in like the club <laughs> drinking and I'm lit. But it's like, this beautiful thing about being an artist is even if you lit or whatever it is you do, like you can always do what you do. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about our job. Like, especially I'm one of those people that like, I can function. You can make no it work. What. Yeah, make yeah, it yeah work. exactly. And marketing <laughs> and PR is so important because without it, you're you're just not going anywhere. It's the most, and you have to market yourself. It's like I'm marketing myself, and then I of course have your assistance and just being able to market myself, like globally. You know, like you need to have that. It's very important. Like one thing I've learned. You know, in the music business, it's like 10, once you master music, that's like 10%. The other 90% is like just music business. Boom. You know, you know what I mean? And, and big <laughs> shout out Matthew Knowles, Beyonce's father. He was one of my mentors. I learned a lot from him as well, you know. And it's funny because I met um, Matthew Knowles. I didn't meet him personally, but I was in a room where he was speaking in yeah. Saudi Arabia yeah. um, last November. And he was speaking about PR, branding, the music entertainment. And the one thing he was very strict on, he was like, your image, your PR, your marketing is like, you got to look the right way. You don't have to, don't, you don't have to introduce yourself and say, I'm an artist. Like when somebody looks yeah. at you, they should know you're an artist just from how you look. Yeah. Then number two, we have to hear like quality um, music from you. And then you have to bring it on to us. Like, I'm not just going to discover you from nowhere. So it was so interesting because I thought, I don't know what I thought he was going to talk about, but it's just like, these are the mm -hmm. basics. Yeah. It was so funny when I met him, it was so crazy. Like we were, um, he invited me for a meeting. At first he wanted to sign me. And then, uh, and fun, funny enough, like I was, um, shout out Jason Hughes and Tony Washington from radio and another mentor, Tony Washington passed away. Mm. And um, I was performing at, um, was it called Birthday Bash in Atlanta? And I knew um, at the time his girl group Blush um, and Matthew Knowles were there. So I'm about to perform. Oh, yeah. And they're, they're walking in. So you see Beyonce's, I'm like, man, I'm about to kill this. So I'm performing. And I go, while I'm performing, I go right in front of Matthew Knowles and perform towards him, you know? And then after that, we talked. And he was like, yo, I love that. And I was talking to him while I was in Kenya, actually, because I left. And then I did the remix. Chucky produced the remix to his girl group, you know, called Old School Back. And um, that was kind of like how we connected. And then um, I had a meeting at his office and they were talking about Afro pop. And I'm like, at that time, you know, Afro pop wasn't the main word. It was mm. Afro beats. So this guy was like, yo, they had a guy in there was talking about it, but it was like, I'm like, 
how are these guys talking about African music? There's no Africans in here. So I was like, you know, it's called Afro Beats, right? I'm like, if you look at the hashtag, there's probably like 2 million hashtags for Afro Beats. Afro Beat at the time probably had like 100,000 on the hashtag. And then Afro Pop, you know? So I'm like, and then that day he was like, you know what? From now on, we're calling it Afro Beats. So then he was like, man, I really don't need to help you or sign you, you know, because you kind of already know what you're doing. Yeah. But I need your help. And he, that's when he offered me the position to be, um, you know, his record label is called Music World, to be president of Music World Afro Beats. And at that time, that's around the time where he just was, you know, was diagnosed with breast cancer. You know, so that's kind of like how things didn't work out that time. He was focused on his health. Mm. You know, I know he's a lot better now. But, um, you know, him offering that position was a big deal for me, you know. Like, I saw, you know, pictures of... Um, you know, Beyonce's kids before they came out, like in his office, you know what I mean? Like, it was <laughs> interesting. I met the, the CEO, head of Essence in that office, and it was just like, you know, I learned a lot. You could have lot. just sold those pictures to TMZ if you wanted to make money, you know, dude. All right, but I, you know, I tried not to think like that, but I thought, you know, thoughts cross your mind. <laughs> and it was interesting, like, you know, one thing you spoke about, um, I, I had brought him to my university. I got him booked to speak at my university, and he was like... um, he asked a question. He was like, how many people in here on Instagram? And everybody put their hand up. And yeah. he was like, we got you. You know, like, we control you through social media. Like, him speaking as a music industry. And he was like, um, you know, that whole situation in the elevator with Beyonce, Solange, and Jay-Z, he said that was a Jedi mind trick. You know, so when you think about what that means, like, you know, it's going to take us time to understand what I'm saying because I'm not the one to... It's not my story to tell, but, you know, it's like a lot of things that happen in the industry is the Jedi mind trick. So you kind of know how to market things where it's like you you have to manipulate things that are happening to make it work for what's happening, if that makes sense. No, I don't understand. You tell know? us what was happening in the lift, you know. Man, it's a Jedi mind trick, man. The Star Wars fans, you know. They'll 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 get to it. Okay. You know, okay. we okay. talk about it off camera. Okay, you know, okay, right? okay, okay. I'm um, Jedi mind tricking right there. So, you know, <laughs> big shout out, Matthew. So. Yeah, so uh, well, thank you so much for your time, for being so awesome, for being the vibe lord, you know, for uh, working with me and my team for years. Oh, thank um, you. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to remind you something very um oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember when you literally called me out and why you called me out and i don't know if you remember exactly what happened because it shaped me so much like it made me the person i am today mm -hmm. and especially how i run business and how i communicate with clients do you remember exactly what yeah, happened yeah, yeah. i think i didn't get I didn't get a uh, feedback I wanted or, or just our communication wasn't yeah. there about what was going on, something like that. Yeah. You know, and for me, I'm just very vocal. Like, you know, it's like there's a way you can express being frustrated or yeah. upset without being disrespectful. So it wasn't like that. It was just like a miscommunication, yeah. which when you're building a partnership and you're doing business, it's it has gonna to ha happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And how you react kind of shows who you're dealing with, and it shows the other person what kind of person you're dealing with. And you're either going to grow together or you're going to grow apart. Oh, my God. And, you said right, it. You said had, everything. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't even matter why we had a team. Right, right, right. But it's how you approached me, how you were, yeah. like, straight up, like, yeah. you, this is not how you run business. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like this. Yeah, but I was also learning, too, like, it took me a long time to also understand, like, I don't know what you were doing, what you was going through, or what business. You, I'm sure you, you know, sometimes we all get overwhelmed with what yeah. we're doing. So sometimes you also got got to put yourself in the other person's shoes and be understanding. I think I think you know? in summary, you were just saying, like, if, if, I, if you're going to work with me, if I'm going to work with you, we have to keep up a communication. Like, I need to know what's happening with my brand every day. Like, I cannot not have heard from you from two weeks and then you show up. The third week, and mm. you're like, yo, what's up? So you're like, I don't appreciate that. Like, I need to know what's happening <laughs> on my brand every day. And I was like, okay. And I think since then, I, I totally understood the type of person you are, the type of creative you are, the type of artist you are. But then it's not a just, just about who you mm. are, but it's how to keep up a brand. Like, even for me to keep up my brand and to keep up my business, I can be on it with one artist and not on it with another artist. So I have to say that how you demanded to be treated in this business relationship 
taught me how to treat other artists and clients and thank you for that. Oh, man, thank you for yeah. receiving and we've been working <laughs> together ever since. So let's take it to the next. Let's and, take and, it to the next level. Right. And soon to come, you know, I just spoke to Wyclef the day before yesterday. So he wants to come to Kenya. And um, I spoke to Faith Evans. Oh my God, also. Kanja, your so, name yeah, dropping. To, yeah, yeah, and this real <laughs> name drops, you feel me? So this ain't the, I'm actually wanna, uh, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning them is because <laughs> I want to have that bridge from me being America to here because a lot of artists don't know what Africa is like and they're kind of scared to come here. But me being, I could talk like them, sound like them, even though, you know, I know how to flip it so they can understand like, yo, I'm like, yo, come, I'll show you the way. Yeah. You know, so we're, you know, and you go PR, King Kanja and Empire, we're going to get all that popping. So Let's you know. do this. Let's do this. Yeah. You so heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, you had it here first. So yeah. we'll let you know when Kanja, single, Kanja yeah. is dropping yeah, the yeah. album Kanja this year, 2023, yeah. right? I hope so. You know, I'm I just, hope I'm so. In, I'm I in hope a, I'm so. I'm in a weird space musically. Like right now, I'm just on a, like a dropping singles thing. And I it's feel like. It's fine. Let's just drop yeah, the singles and then yeah. at the end, we'll give them an album. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's what I'm going to do. I, I really don't know when. But yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's definitely going to be this year. Hope so. Hope yeah. so. What do you want to say to your fans, um, just as a wrap up? Like, do you want to say thank you for all the support? Yeah. What should I, they look forward to? I would say know what you love, do what you love, and know how to love. You know, that's what I would say. And always live your life creatively, and never, you know, always go on your journey and never look back unless you're only looking back to see how far you've gone. You know, what I mean, that's the only time I look back. Mm. Like, oh, let me see how far back. And like, for every time I come to Kenya is when I realize what I've done since I was last year. Like, I always like to top myself when I come back to Kenya. Like, well, mm. did I do as much as I could? So, you know, just keep, you know, keep it going and just stay branding. And, and I want to see the unity in the Kenyan music industry. I want this industry to grow. Because right now, you know, Kenyan music industry doesn't, is not in the place where I, I feel it should be mm. in the world of African and Afrobeats. There's Afro a lot beats. of work to be done. And there's a lot of work to be done. And it starts with unity. Yeah. You know, if you see how, you know, Nigerian, uh, you know, artists, they may not like each other, but they they know how to make money together. And, you true, know, true that. You know, so, but I want to see the Kenyan industry be, you know, it just takes the, you know, the unity. And I was with Boutros last night. Yo, I like his song, Angela. It's funny. We we were all at um, Gemini and um, me and him, we was in the basement and we just had a deep, deep conversation. Me, him and Juice Man. <sighs> mm. And I, you know, I, I love what they're doing, and uh, me and him about to get in the studio. But yeah, nice. that was a vibe. Like you know, those conversations. Yes. Like if you see on my Instagram story right now, you know, those who are watching ain't gonna see it. But you know, <laughs> like we was having like a deep. It was so deep yesterday. Nice, you know, nice, so nice. Much love. Thank you so much, yeah. Kanja, for Thank you. being here, for being present, for being the vibe lord, for always giving us great music, great yeah. music videos for showing us the extent to which your dreams can take you. You know, you could meet anywhere. You could sit in any room. Yeah. Only if you open the doors for yourself and push yourself to whatever place you want to go. That's quite inspiring what you continue to do. Um, yeah, and I love you. And oh, I, I wish you, you well. Yeah. And please come back to Kenya yeah, often. Yeah, yeah. You always um, got to open that door. If the door is not open, you better not. Because, you know, you never know what's on the other side. So Fantastic. So it's yeah. a wrap. Um, on this episode with King Kanja, please make sure you follow my podcast VIP Access. Every single week, I'll be speaking to a super, super individual. They could be an artist, a music producer, or a creative. They'll be letting us into their life and into um, the journey of how they became who they are. Thank you so much, King Kanja. Thank you. Much love. We out here. You already know. <laughs> Cheers, 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 cheers. VIP access. VIP access. With Aniko on Africa Loud.